Okay, so we are now live on Facebook. I will admit participants now. Okay. Okay, Dr. Pavlik, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Aido. Then let's begin. So, oh, hello everyone and greetings from the TRACES laboratory here at the RIT in Ateneo de Manila University. A warm welcome to our archaeology webinar series that presents current research and new discoveries in archaeology and paleoecology. It is our great pleasure to have as today's speaker, Professor Dr. Rintaro Ono from the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka. Dr. Ono is a renowned expert on maritime archaeology and anthropology, mm -hmm. and specifically human maritime adaptation processes including human migration into island Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, the history of human maritime exploitation and maritime trade. He has been involved in many research projects in Japan, in Indonesia, the Philippines, Micronesia and Melanesia. And he discovered actually the earliest evidence for open sea fishing as early as 42,000 years ago at the cave site in East Timor and reported on the maritime skills of early modern humans together with his colleagues Sue O'Connor and Chris Clarkson in Science Magazine. Dr. Ono is a lead investigator of the transdisciplinary and multinational cultural history of Paleo-Asia program, which conducts research on various aspects of the migrations, expansions, and cultures of Homo sapiens across Asia. Dr. Ono is currently heading excavations at several sites in Sulawesi and Okinawa, which he will present today in his talk, of course. He has been a visiting researcher and research fellow at several national and international laboratories and universities. He is a prolific author who has numerous publications with leading international journals and book publishers. And his latest book on Pleistocene archaeology and migration, technology, and adaptation actually just came out last December. For this webinar, we have none other than our own Dr. Rick Fuentes from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology as respondent. And I'm very happy that he has agreed to join us in today's webinar. 
The host and manager of this webinar is again Mr. Aido Balboa from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, who will also lead through the Q&A section later. On behalf of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and ASIA, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, I'd like to thank the people and institutions that made this webinar series possible. The members of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Social Sciences, the Office of the Vice President for University and Global Relations, Kalipunang Sociologia at Anthropologia, Arete, the Creativity and Innovation Hub of the Ateneo de Manila University, and the Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. I will now hand over to Dr. Rentaro Ono and his talk on human migration and island adaptation in maritime Asia, cases of island Southeast Asia and the Ryukyu Islands. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dr. Ono. Okay, Maravin uh, Salamat for Arfet for introduction of myself and my uh, career. And uh, yes, uh, as he uh, introduced, uh, my topic today is um, human migration and island adaptation in maritime Asia, especially for the case of island Southeast Asia, or Wallacea we call, and also the Ryukyu Islands in Okinawa in Japan. So two islands uh, environments and two cases. And uh, my name is Rintaro, Rintaro Ono. Uh, I'm working at National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, now um, part of lockdown, uh, as maybe same as in Manila. And, uh, but I'm also talk, uh, today's talk from my office at the museum. Anyway, nice to see you. And uh, I'd like to start my presentation now. So, uh, okay. Okay, so my topic is the, the first three is migration, it means human migration and maritime habitation in Wallacea regions. And uh, human migrations by Homo sapiens to the Australia and the New Guinea, uh, it, otherwise we call Safur land, Safur continent in the present times, possibly back to 65,000 to 50,000 years ago, BP represent the earliest evidence uh, of intentional and relatively long distance over 50 to 80 kilometers seafaring by modern human or because Homo sapiens, our species in this world. And exactly the recent excavations at late Thirsting sites in Wallace regions also providing evidences of early aquatic culture and coastal or terrestrial, terrestrial resources exploitations. And today I'd like to introduce um, three major sites, uh, some, of, some of which I uh, have excavated by myself and, and our team, including uh, Alfred and uh, Rixa, Dr. Uh, Rixa Fuentes. And, uh, and later I'd like to introduce uh, other cases in the Ryukyu Islands. So, but firstly, um, maybe you, you, you you guys know about Wallacea, but I show you what the Wallacea region is. So this map is uh, Wallacea and Sunda and Safura, as you can see. And in the during the light, last uh, glacial times or right, last ice age or, or Pleistocene times, uh, as you can see, the Borneo Islands and Java and Sumatra, all connected to the Asian uh, mainland and form like Sundaland, very big uh, continent. On the other hand, uh, in the Oceania regions, um, Australia continent and New Guinea connected together and form a very big, uh, large uh, continent called Safulu. But between these um, continent, we have the Wallacea regions, is island and the uh, ocean regions, even during the uh, Pleistocene times or last ice age. And the boundary line is called Wallace line. It's made by uh, Alfred Boris. And depending on, on, the, on the, the, uh, habitation zones of uh, Asian uh, animals and also the Oceanian animals, especially the mammal distributions. And uh, you, as you can see in, in the Philippines, the Palawan uh, partly connected to the, to the Sundaland or Borneo uh, during the last ice age. So uh, it's connected to the uh, continent. 
but all these other um, islands in the Philippines is belong to the Wallachia regions, means not connected to the continent and divided by the, the sea gap. And also like in Eastern Indonesian islands, like Sulawesi and other places, Maluku or Timor, where I'm going talking about today, is also belong to the Wallachia and um, in, in the island regions during the last Pleistocene times or last ice age. <clears throat> So when the first, first uh, homo sapiens or modern human uh, like to uh, reach to the Oceanian regions or Safur land, they have to cross these island zone in Wallacea. So that's why uh, we archeologists um, have hypothesis uh, that human uh, adaptation, maritime adaptation may be developed in this zone or during the time they migrate to the Wallacean regions and when after they survive here, and then through uh, process they, they are, during the migration from Wallacea to the, the Oceanian regions, uh, their uh, adaptation is much progressed. So this is the case of Wallacea. Okay, and the second one uh, in this presentation, I also would like to talk about the Ryukyu case, Ryukyu Islands uh, in Okinawa, Japan. And the migration to the Ryukyu Islands in Okinawa, possibly back to over 35,000 BP years ago, represents one of the earliest evidences of intentional and longer distance, and much longer this time, about more than 150 to 200 kilometer seafaring to the remote islands. It's not to the continent, but to the remote islands by modern human in this world. So the Ryukyu case is showing the, uh, also the early evidence to the sea crossing uh, and migration to the remote Iran, not, not to the big Iran or so big continent. And a uh, little bit younger than the, the case in Wallachia. And the recent expansion uh, at the late Pleistocene sites in the Ryukyu regions also providing uh, evidences of early aquatic culture and coastal or terrestrial resources exploitation as well. So I am also briefly introduce one or two sites uh, recently found uh, later, okay? Firstly, I just um, briefly introduced the location of the Ryukyu Islands, and uh, maybe some of, some of you guys have been already to Ryukyu uh, or Okinawa. And the Ryukyu Islands located between um, mainland main island of Japan, Honshu, and Taiwan, and the, the total distance of of, um, of um, the islands, the Ryukyu Island is almost uh, one thousand and two hundred kilometer from the north to the south. Or south to the north. And uh, mainly these islands are divided into the three groups uh, from the north to the south, uh, like A in northern Ryukyu and B for uh, central Ryukyu and as C as southern Ryukyu. And each group was divided or, or had the sea gap, divided by sea gaps. And the longest one is Kerama gap, that's between Okinawa islands and Miyako, so B and C. And even the A and C, so like from Taiwan to the southern Ryukyu, if, if human want to cross the sea, they have to cross at least 80 kilo or 100 kilometer of the sea crossing to reach the small islands. Yeah. And the longest one is the, the, the Kerama Gap that's located between Okinawa Islands and Miyako Island. And that's or exactly uh, um, the distance is over 270 kilo and it's quite long and actually the longest gap in Japan. And also or, uh, in, in late plus in times, if, if really human, human beings cross this ocean, uh, could be one of the uh, oldest um, case of sea crossing by modern human, but we're not sure yet. Anyway, this is the case in Okinawa. Okay. So, so the aims of this presentation is first re reviewing and introducing some major price insights in Wallacea and the Ryukyu Islands by focusing on the early modern humans' terrestrial and marine resources use and their subsistence strategies. And then in the next stage, um, if we have time, I'd like to discuss in, uh, the possible migration routes from Wallacea into Safuru or Oceania regions and also possible methods of seafaring, how they cross sea, uh, both in Wallacea and the Ryukyu Islands in the next. 
Okay, so firstly, I'd like to start about the case in Wallachia. And, and the map showing the, the major archaeological sites, Pleistocene sites in Wallachia regions, and also the possible migration routes uh, inside of Wallachia to uh, into the Oceania region, I mean the Safuru continents. And you can see two lines in a two, two color. The, the yellow color one is, is we call northern uh, routes, migration routes, possible migration routes. And the green one is the, the southern uh, migration routes. And in along both routes, uh, some pricing sites located. And uh, I pick up three uh, sites for today. And one is a Talao, a uh, Lian Saru site on Talao Islands. The, this island is be, uh, located between Mindanao and Sulawesi, and one of the remote islands. But uh, the trace is back to 35,000 35, years ago. And the next one is uh, Goa Topogaro site in, in the central Sulawesi, uh, exactly located along, along the northern routes. And now back to 30,000 30, years ago. And uh, the, the third one is Jeremari site in Eastern Timor, located the eastern coast of East Timor or Timor Island. It's exactly located along the southern route and just before uh, the crossing to uh, uh, sea crossing to Australia, Australian coast. And I'd like to start from the uh, Jeremara case in the southern routes first, and then uh, introduce about the northern routes uh, sites, two sites in the northern routes. So firstly, about the case of Jeremara in East Timor, uh, as Alfred uh, mentioned just before, this site produced a large number of uh, uh, fish remains and also the fish hooks. And uh, uh, excavation was done by uh, Dr. Sue O'Connor at the Australian National, National University in 2005. And I didn't join this uh, excavation, but I joined the analysis of the fish remains. And the dates of the sites is the lowest layer back to 42,000 to 37,000 years ago. So it's one of this date is one of the oldest dates in Wallachia as a Homo sapiens site, and the middle layer is dated back to about twenty three thousand to forty thousand years ago. It's exactly the time of LGM we call uh, last glacial maximum, the most coldest time in the last uh, last last ice age, and the upper layer is grown to about eight thousand to four thousand years ago. It's in the Holocene time. It's more warmer times. And the site produced large number of lithics, stone tools, and shell fish hooks, and shell ornaments, as well as shell and fish remains, and small animal remains like giant rats or lizard, bats, couscous, and wild boar, etc. But all the animal remains are uh, middle size or small size one, no large size animal. But most, yeah, okay, this is the uh, picture of. Um, Jeremara. It's quite small limestone cave, and uh, the ANU team excavated only uh, two test pits, one by one meter test pits, uh, during 2005. And but find a very nice uh, sequence of the deposit, uh, basically divided to three cultural layers uh, from the late Pleistocene and LGM time and the Holocene times. And what surprising is the, the very huge number of fish bone uh, were uh, produced uh, from both units, especially from, from the unit B. It's just one by one meter square uh, pro provided uh, large numbers of the fish bones. And I um, identified all these bones by analysis and I counted all the bones and it's almost over almost 40,000 pieces of bones, of fish bones only from the one by one meter test pit, excavated and quite large numbers. And about 50% of them could be identified as elements and also to the family level or species level. And very surprisingly, uh, many of the fish bones from the lower layer, means the oldest layer, uh, dominated by scombrids. Scombrids is the, 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 uh, like a tuna groups yellow fin and skipjack tuna. Tuna is very fast swimmer and, and 
and hard to catch by by um, like hand or sparing, and might be need the fish uh, hook fishing or angling skills. Uh, but all these uh, traces back to forty two thousand years ago, and so far the oldest uh, evidence. Uh, of human use of the tuna fishes so far, even until now. And all these bones, uh, vertebral bones, uh, are on the left hand side, uh, belong to the scombrids. But uh, other size is treberies, is you know, karangidae species in, in the right hand side. side. Anyway, I, I did this all, um, identification. And also, the site provide, uh, produce large number of and um, variety of uh, shell ornaments. Many, many kinds of shell ornaments back to 38,000 or almost 40,000 years ago, BP. And also the site produced a shellfish hook made from trochas, trochas shell. And one of them are possibly uh, back to 21,000 BP years ago. And at this time, it could be the earliest evidence of fish hook in the world as well. Uh, the one in the right hand side. side. And also that some of the pricing sites in, in the Timor also provided um, many this kind of uh, fish hooks, uh, a bit younger than the, the Jerbarai, but like uh, 10,000 or 12,000 years BP. And also in the Alol Islands, the, the islands next to the Timor. So these islands have a uh, uh, long time of, uh, a long history of uh, hook fishing or angling fishing culture. Uh, by Homo sapiens. So, so as conclusion, active marine exploitation, including tuna fishing, possibly with angling or active use of shell as ornaments, uh, were one of the uh, specific character of the culture in these regions. And uh, all these fish hooks, uh, as I say, uh, also from the other sides. So. For the, for the main factor of such culture may be scarce of large middle-sized mammals, as there's no, no large mammals here, uh, at least from the archaeological sites, and terrestrial animals may be the possible factor for such higher maritime orientation in these regions. So this is one of the hypotheses and the questions. Okay, so I uh, switch to the next one to, in the case of uh, Northern routes. And first case is about Rian Saru, uh, Talal Islands. And, and this site also produced uh, three different cultural layers. And the lowest layer dated to around 35,000 years to 32,000 years BP years ago. And the middle layer is um, about 21,000 and 17,000 years BP exactly as LGM time, the coldest time during the last ice age. While the upper layer is dated around 10,000 to 8,000 years ago as Ari Holocene. So uh, the layers and the deposit is quite uh, close, uh, similar with what we what they found in the Jeremiah, but a bit younger. And large number of uh, and the site produce large number of uh, marine shell remains and chart flakes, but very surprisingly, no fish animal uh, no fish and animal remains were ex excavated from the site. So only the shell, marine shell, mainly marine shell, and the chart flakes back to thirty five thousand years ago. Okay. So firstly, I just introduced uh, the location of the Talao Islands. And as you can see in the map, uh, Talao Island is located between Mindanao in the Philippines and Sulawesi in Indonesia now. And from both islands, from each any islands, uh, it takes about, the distance is more than 100 kilo to reach this island, these islands. So the Talao Islands located as very remote islands even during the late Pliocene times in Ice Age. So uh, the existence of human remains or human traces in these islands means in, in, in somehow the, the past uh, human uh, homo sapiens groups uh, reached to this island, 
we don't know it's by drifting or intentional. We don't show yet, but at least somebody uh, was here. Okay. But the traces of human life is only the shellfish and the chart remains. And I myself um, analyzed all the shell remains excavated from the site. Uh, it's over 3,000 numbers of shell, marine shells, and I identified 53 taxa. And uh, our analysis clearly demonstrate that the target species have changed over the past 20,000 years. While the major shellfish ex exploited in the site were mainly Tavo shell in the left and Trocas shell in the, the middle one, and the Narita shell, a bit small species of uh, Murray shell, uh, uh, the one in the right hand side on the rear side. Okay. And uh, the temporal uh, changes of these major species or family also shows most of these um, taxa or, or major shell species were exploited during the LGM time about 20,000 years ago. And that's mean it's in the most coldest time, uh, maybe human have to uh, focus uh, on the uh, resources or like a shell, shell or coastal resources during that time. Maybe because of the limited resources of uh, land terrestrial resources uh, in the cold climate times. That's one of the hypotheses. And also the site produced large number of lithics, especially the chart flakes. And uh, the useful analysis by Dan, uh, were done by uh, Rick Rixa, Dr. Rick uh, Fuentes, and also Alfred, uh, Dr. Alfred Pollock. So um, the detail maybe uh, information can be provided by, by them later, but I just mentioned uh, after their analysis, surprisingly, most of these lithics were not possibly not used for like hunting or animal use, but mainly used for the plant processing. So that's might be the reason, and it's exactly match with the result of our excavation as no animals and no fish remains from the site. So uh, the, the case of Rian Saru uh, indicate the existence of human activities in such remote islands, like over hundred kilometer, away from other locations, indicate the possible maritime habitation uh, as well. But active use of shellfish, while no fish and animal remains in the Ansaru, possibly indicate scarce of these resources or very limit of the human technology, as like they are very hard to access to the open sea uh, to catch fish uh, or something like that. Because no fish hooks either from the site. And the Talao ha only has some bats, Bats and cuscus species, very small uh, size mammals, as wild mammals in the recent times, even the recent times, and the no large leaf along their coast in even in nowadays in a warmer warmer weather uh, climate. So during the late Pleistocene in the Ice Age, um, the the area uh, of the coral reef is more limited or maybe nothing. So it's very hard to uh, do the fishing in the, in the coastal. And um, if they want to catch uh, fishes, um, they have to go to the open sea. And usually the, the open sea in the Tao is uh, quite rough and very risky to catch fish. So that's maybe one of the reasons there's no fish from the side. Okay, the last case is about the uh, Topogaro Capes in Central Sulawesi. And uh, we excavated um, this cave site. It's a complex site uh, since 2016 until now, but we temporarily stopped because of the COVID-19 attack uh, since the 2019. Uh, but by the end of the year uh, 2018, we excavated um, depths of three meter, three meter depths of the site in the deposit in Topogara 2 cave. And we found 12 layers down to three meters and dated back to about 29,000 years ago. And the middle layer is dated around 80,000 to 9,000 years ago. So some layers back to like LGM and some back to uh, uh, early Holocene times. And upper layers also back to 2,000 years ago. And, and the, the most youngest date is about three to 200 years ago. 
So it's all already is in uh, historical times. So uh, the, this site has really compact of uh, many um, human traces of bar various ages, different ages of uh, in human history. So it's a really good site. And the site also produce large number of uh, mangrove or inshore shell uh, fish shell, shellfish remains, and also the small mammals like rats and bats, and chart flakes and, and numbers of chart flakes with few babirusa and anoa bones. Babirusa is kind of the wild boar uh, domesticated uh, uh, inhabited in the Sulawesi, and anoa is kind of the water buffalo, also endemic species in the in Sulawesi. Um, a bit so it's kind of uh, middle to large size mammal. But uh, you can see there's no fish bones from this site. And the site is exactly located about 3.5 kilometer away from the current coast. So it's not so far from the coast, but um, our result uh, show there's no uh, fish, fish bones and uh, no marine resources yet so, so much. So again, we check the location and uh, uh, Germara uh, Guatapogaro is located exactly on the uh, middle of the along the uh, uh, northern routes or human migration routes to the Pacific, uh, to the Maroc Islands, and then to our New Guinea regions. So very strategic points. And I also uh, briefly introduced the, our latest excavation result in 2019, just before the COVID-19 attack. And uh, we further excavated uh, the site in Goa Topogaro 2, and we down, excavated down to five meter in depth, but still find numbers of lithics, stone tools, and final remains, uh, especially like Anoa, the, the large mammal bones. And, and these uh, layers, like uh, uh, in depths of four meter, uh, can be uh, older than 40,000 years old. And actually we have some c dates, but not published yet. So uh, I cannot talk about, uh, about it details today, but uh, uh, we know th this site is also um, one of the oldest sapiens site in, in the Russian region, same like a JMRI now. And you can see the, the section, uh, wall section of the Topogao 2 uh, down to the five meters. And the hole is uh, the traces of a uh, sampling, a uh, soil sampling for OSL dating. OSL dating is uh, the date dating from the, the use of the soil, directly from the soils and the minerals. Uh, we can also have the datings. And this is still on the process, but you can see the, how, how deep the deposits are. And still from the depths of four meter and five meter depths and layers, uh, we found this kind of chart materials and uh, chart, yeah, core tools made from the chart. And also like uh, uh, Anoa, uh, final remains, I'm a bones. Okay. And we also found lots of uh, lithics, especially chart flakes. And uh, all these uh, assemblage were uh, analyzed by like a useful analysis uh, by um, uh, Dr. Fuentes and uh, Rixa and also Dr. Paulik, Alfred. So um, the details maybe can be um, provided by them, but the same, same like Lian Saru, uh, the, the result of the analysis also show uh, some of them or many of them are also use, pot potentially use, uh, possibly use for uh, process, uh, plant processing. But some like, uh, some visit like um, um, excavated from the Holocene layers, uh, like I'm showing now, uh, possibly also use of the bone materials or making of the bone materials, more hard, hard materials. And exactly uh, this site also produce numbers of bone projectile points and tools, bone tools from the, mainly from the Holocene level, but a few, uh, some of them are also from the Pleistocene level. So they also use this kind of material for the maybe for the huntings and for various uh, uh, reasons or activities or purposes. And the site also produce shell ornaments or other kind of ornaments as well. Okay, but I skipped the details today. Uh, and regarding the fauna remains, uh, two caves, Topogaro one and two, uh, produce huge volume of shellfish remains. 
and Topogaro II site, the, the deep cave site, uh, also produces uh, couscous and sass, I mean the wild boar, and anoa remains uh, back to 8,000 to 29,000 BP, uh, back to the late Placid times. So uh, the people catch it, uh, hunt it, and use uh, many kinds of the land, terrestrial, terrestrial uh, animals and remains. Sure. So this case um, shows um, no traces of active marine use. So the both cases in the southern uh, northern routes, like Lianzaru and also um, the Topogaro, show no no active marine use, like fish and hooks, except shellfish use on that site along the northern route. And however, more intensive use of terrestrial resources for food, tool, and also the ornament. Uh, at least in Sulawesi case, we can say so. So uh, if we compare with the case in uh, northern, northern, uh, northern routes and also the southern routes, we have some differences. And such differences in their toolkits especially like uh, lithic tools and uh, fishing tools may have great impact by each environment location and maybe available resources. That's one of the hypotheses. So even in the, the Wallachian regions, we have two different type of uh, strategies. Um, maybe it's because of the this environment or iron environments in the past. So uh, we see again, so now we just overview three sites, two located in the northern parts in the northern routes, and one located Jerbarai located in the southern routes in the southern Wallacea. Okay. So what we can uh, discuss from from these differences, uh, firstly the the northern case northern migration routes, uh, you can see the each islands. The distance between the islands uh, from Sulawesi or Talao Islands to Maluku uh, are slightly longer. It's more than 50 kilos sometimes. But the distance from Maluku Islands to New Guinea coast uh, much shorter. That's what I mean is uh, once you reach the, the human reach to the Maluku Islands, if they could reach to the Maluku Islands, then uh, from the Maluku to the New Guinea coast is quite close, not so far. or they can they can migrate they could migrate by like hopping iron hopping uh, more easy to to reach to the new guineas but terrestrial environments are more wet and much wider distribution of forest area in the northern parts like in Sulawesi and Sulawesi has rich animal and terrestrial resources while terrestrial resources in Maluku islands might be much poorer and so far, we, we don't find any like stegodon, the big elephant, elephant or large mammals in the Maluku Islands. So possibly that if the Ari Homo sapiens could reach to the Maluku, they could um, fastly move to the New Guinea's island or Saful continent. That's one of the hypotheses, but we're not sure yet. Anyway, this is the migration routes from the north, northern part. And like a uh, uh, Talaud case, uh, the islands is really uh, limited resources in, in inland as well. And on the other hand, in the case of the southern migration routes, a distance between the islands are sh much shorter. So uh, the, the uh, even the early Homo sapiens uh, might be able to uh, migrate very faster uh, to the end of uh, East Timor. At least, but the distance between the Timor Islands to the northern Australian coast or Safu coast are uh, a bit longer, over 80 kilometer. So they have to cross the sea a very long distance to reach the Australia. And the secondary, in terms of the environment, terrestrial environment are more dry and less forest with very limited terrestrial animal resources and variety in, in the islands around the uh, southern route. But uh, stegodon uh, species uh, did exist uh, by at least by the LGM time. Uh, like in the case in Flores, we have a lot found lots of um, uh, stegodon uh, fossil uh, remains from the site, cave site. And uh, Timor case, we're not sure yet, 
the snow or stegodon um, remains from the archaeological site, but they did exist uh, before in uh, Pleistocene times because we found some of the fossilized uh, bone, stegodon bone in, in, in the Timor. Anyway, easy access and much wider visi uh, visibility down to Timor and higher need for marine use and maritime habitation uh, could be occur uh, in the southern islands, uh, southern, uh, southern islands around the southern uh, migration routes. Okay, so this is a case for the uh, Wallacea in the during the light, last uh, late Pleistocene times. And now we switch to the, the case in the Ryukyu Islands in the, during the Pleistocene times. And this map is showing the, uh, some major uh, Pleistocene sites in, in, in the Ryukyu Islands or Okinawa. Uh, sorry, some of uh, still in the Japanese, but you can see um, uh, major, major islands like Ishigaki Islands in the southern Ryukyu and Miyako Island in the middle, and then Okinawa Islands in the bit the biggest islands in, in the Ryukyu Islands. And there are many uh, pristine sites, back to 35,000 to 30,000 BP. And you can also see that Taiwan is exactly connected to the China continent. So during the late Pleistocene, Taiwan was actually connected to the China as part of the mainland. So we're not sure uh, where the, the people, the first human, uh, modern human in, in Okinawa, came from, possibly from the north and possibly from the south or, or possibly from the board. Uh, but from the south, you have to cross a black current. Black current is quite fast uh, current, uh, actually from, from Philippines, through from the Philippines to, to enter to the uh, Duke Islands. And it's about two to four knots speed. So really fast. So if the fast, uh, human, uh, modern human groups um, came from Taiwan regions, they have to cross the black current. And also, uh, as you, as I discussed just uh, before, they have to also cross some gaps, sea gaps in the Ryukyu Islands as well. But uh, very interestingly, most of these plots inside produce uh, human remains, uh, Homo sapiens remains, and some are very complete bones like Minatogawa in Okinawa. Uh, some were actually complete uh, uh, Homo sapiens bones back to 20,000 years ago. And this is the oldest uh, complete uh, human remains in the Asian regions uh, as a Homo sapiens. And now, uh, recently, we found further uh, two sites produce a very interesting result. One is uh, Shiraho Saoneta Baru site in Ishigaki Island. And this site, uh, newly found after the 2000 something. And um, now the site produced 90 individuals of human remains dated back to 28,000 years ago. And this is the first uh, place in site in Ishigaki. So before, before the, uh, the finding of this site, there's no place in traces of human in uh, Ishigaki or uh, Southern Ryukyu. And now we found uh, many, many traces. And um, as you can see, uh, this site is located in the new airport in Ishigaki. So you can see the ANA uh, airplane in behind. And uh, actually this is a cave site, but unfortunately because of the construction of the airport, the overhang of the cave was destroyed at the time of the construction. So it looks like no cave, but actually this is cave site. And uh, uh, underneath is all safe. And the many kinds of bones, or especially the human bones, were excavated. And you can see some of the, the uh, individual can be uh, reconstructed as complete skeleton, uh, like number four. And uh, now this one is back to 28,000 years ago. So can be most, most the oldest uh, complete bones, human bones in, in the Asian regions now. And another site is Sakitari cave site. This is exactly like cave site. Uh, in Okinawa. This, this site is located in Okinawa Island, and the site uh, also produced the oldest shellfish hook dated back to 23,000 years ago, uh, this kind of, uh, and also made from trochas. So same, uh, 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 same kind of shell were used both in the Wallacea region and also in Okinawa regions. 
and both date back to the late Pliocene, around 20, 20 something thousand years ago, uh, means uh, both places have um, that the human uh, maritime adaptation did develop in both Iran region, in both Russia and the Ryukyu Islands. And the site also produced human and animal remains from the Sakitari cave. Okay. So uh, in terms of the other fauna remains in Japan, Okinawa, I just uh, briefly introduce, uh, actually in Japan, we also have like large mammals like uh, uh, stegodon elephants, and also deer, many kinds of deers, and, and also the bison species in Japan, but during the last uh, late Pleistocene times or last glacial periods. But all these big mammals were extinct until the uh, Holocene times. Possibly because of the, the climate change, but more, uh, more impact by the human, human impact could be the, the most important factors uh, or significant factors for the extinction of these large mammals. Maybe other cases uh, same in, in this world. And during the Holocene times, uh, even now, we only have like small, uh, few species of deer and wild boar and some uh, middle-sized mammals and small-sized mammals in Japan now. But in the Pleistocene times, they have more big mammals in Japan. But on the other hand, in Okinawa case, uh, they don't have so much uh, large uh, middle-sized animals, uh, but still have uh, three uh, different species of deer and uh, wild boar species during the Pleistocene times. Okay, and we, we're not sure where they come from, maybe from the north or maybe from the south. But in any cases, uh, in Okinawa, they don't have so much uh, big mammals or, or, and the run resources is quite limited compared with the main island in Japan and many endemic species of, uh, as well because of the remote locations. So uh, the case of uh, UQ case is quite similar to the case in the Southern Wallacean regions like uh, Timor uh, and other, other islands in, around, around the Southern routes, I think. So in the final uh, part of this uh, presentation, I just briefly discuss about how they cross the ocean in Wallacea and also in the Ryukyu. So it's the navigation technique. And in the Wallacean case, at least uh, they have to cross 80 kilo to 100 kilo to reach the Safur Island, uh, Safur continent to Australia or New Guinea. And uh, in previous study, the first candidate in, of, of the, the te techniques on the boat uh, to cross to use for crossing the sea is a bamboo raft, possible with the sail. Because the bamboo is uh, um, quite easy to proceed, uh, process. And as like uh, uh, Rick and Alfred uh, analysis, use analysis uh, confirm, uh, some of the flakes could be used for the bamboo process, processing. And bamboo is quite important materials, plant materials, even during uh, current, current times. Uh, if, like in the Philippines and the Southeast Asia, um, use can be used for many kinds of the tools uh, and, ma and materials. And also 26 species of bamboo species currently inhabited in Wallacea. So variety of bamboo exists in, in the Wallacean Islands. So more easy to access and more easy to use for, for making, making raft and uh, this kind of uh, boat or seafaring skills. But in case of uh, Ryukyu, uh, more candidates for the past navigation. But uh, one of the important um, uh, technique could be rowing or use a paddling, use a paddle, can be partly significant to reach the small islands. Because as I mentioned just now, uh, there's a black current, very fast current exists uh, in the Ryukyu islands. So they have to cross this fast current. And also, uh, not like in the Wallachian case, the case in UQ, the goal or the target could be the very small and tiny island and very hard to see and hard to reach uh, just by drifting. So for 
for the, the case in Ryukyu and the case in Wallachia must be a bit different. So for seeing such differences, uh, the previous studies, um, uh, recent studies by National Museum of Nature and Science Japan, uh, headed by Dr. Kaifu, uh, tried experimental navigation project uh, during 2013 to 2019. Uh, they tried three different kinds of boat during their project. And first challenge is they used a reed boat. Reed boat is kind of grass, so grass made boat but this one has failed to cross sea. Just after two or three hours after the departure, uh, it's already going to sunk, sink. And actually they sunk because too heavy. And the grass absorb uh, water very quickly and it's getting very heavy to, to sink. Yeah. And uh, so they next, in the next one, they try to use bamboo, but bamboo boat, not the bamboo raft in Taiwan. And they made it in Taiwan and tried to uh, go to Okinawa, one of the island Yonaguni from the Taiwan, but this one also failed to cross the sea. Uh, this one just five or six hours after the departure, uh, they they fell. Um, they could not go 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 much farther. Yeah, I'll show you later about the the bamboo boat here. And the final challenge in the final challenge, they made a dug out canoe by stone tools in Japan, and and. They brought this Dakar canoe, brought to the to Taiwan, and they navigate from Taiwan to Yonaguni Islands. They tried to use the, this um, Dakar canoe and to navigate by five people, five adults, uh, and actually this one succeeded in forty hours of voyage. So now their um, expanded navigation project at least confirmed uh, my poss possibly the the Dakar, uh, can be used, could be used, and also if they use Dagar canoe, they could be could reach to some of the islands from if they they depart from Taiwan. So this is one possibility. So this is a, sort of a big project in Japan, and many uh, Japanese knows about this project because uh, lots of broadcasting and uh, TV programs related to this project by the National Museum of Science, and uh, they tried the first, this is uh, the first grass boat. You can see it really looks heavy. And in this picture, it's already halfway uh, sinking. Yeah, halfway sink, sunk. So I'm very heavy and many, they need many um, uh, uh, people to, to, to paddling because it's quite heavy, but it's very nonsense. And actually it's fail. And the second challenge is bamboo boat. And it, as you can see, it's not bamboo raft. So bamboo boat looks very unstable, looks very first. But uh, once the, the ocean is the, the bad conditions, uh, this kind of boat is really unstable and hard to move, uh, no speed at all. And also it's really nonsense to just paddling, mm, paddling by two to eight kilos or hundred kilometers by just human power. So this is fair as well. So the last challenge by dugout canoe, and this is more stable, of course. And then uh, they also paddling uh, to Yonaguni for over eight kilometer. Yes, and this is Dr. Kaifu. And uh, luckily this uh, final challenge is succeeded. So now we can say maybe if they have in the late per late person time, they have dugout canoe te technology, maybe uh, this, this type of the canoe can be reached to the some islands in UQ. But that's this one just one possibility. We don't have any archaeological uh, records of the uh, Dagger Canoe back to the late Plassey so far. So uh, for the last three, I uh, just uh, introduced the Wallachian case. Actually, in the Wallachia, there is also uh, exper experimental navigation uh, was done in 1990s. That was done by Bednarik and his team. And they tried expanded navigation by uh, bamboo raft. And the first bamboo raft they made is quite heavy and very, very big. It's 23 meter raft and 50 tons. But they made it by use of stone tools, like uh, praise, praise, him, praise the same people, and departed the Roti Islands. Roti is one of the nearest islands from the Timor. Um, but this one was failed 
and uh, they have to return to Roti four days after their departure, just because the, the raft is too big, yeah, and hard to control. And uh, same like uh, a grass pole is going to too heavy and it's going to sink. So, but soon after the first navigation, they tried to make another bamboo raft, we call Naretashi 2, and departed again, uh, but from the Timor coast in late 1998, from the same year, end of the same year, they, they tried a second challenge. And luckily this, the raft uh, was succeeded to reach to the uh, past Safar coastline, about 90 kilometer away from the Timor coast in five days. And then this second raft is also made by um, stone tools. And the size is quite rather smaller than the first one as 80 meter in the length and 2.5 tons uh, in the weight. So much, much smaller and much more lighter. And that's the reason for success of the, the navigation maybe. So you can see um, the, this is the number one is the first uh, bubble raft they made. And the number two is the second uh, bamboo raft. It's much lighter and smaller one, and more like a boat style. And the number one fail, maybe too big. And the number two uh, succeed. So uh, this kind of uh, ex experimental navigation uh, tells us possibly the the bamboo raft could be the 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 big candidate for the late passing crossing crossing or seafaring by homo sapiens to reach Safulu. And maybe the use of the sail could be possible. Even we don't have any uh, archeological remains of uh, uh, use of a sail in back to the pleistocene times because the, these organic materials is quite hard to, to, to left, survive. But uh, uh, they use the, the palm tree, palm leaf uh, made um, sail or mast. So it's uh, sailing uh, mast. So it's a very primitive um, way of the use. And like, it's same like a pandan mat in the Philippines. So it's not so hard to make it. So if this kind of map, maybe they can also use, they could also use for the sailing during the light passing times. Well, we don't know yet, but uh, that's one of the possibility. So that's the case of Wallacea. And this is the, uh, uh, the routes, uh, route of the uh, navigation route uh, in 1998. So they start from the coast of uh, Timor uh, on December. And then after five days, they reach to the, the, the past coastline uh, of the continent, Safar continent, about 90 kilo, kilometer away from the Timor. And then uh, this graph, uh, this raft, also navigate uh, farther east to reach to the, the current coast of uh, Australia, close to the Darwin. Uh, and so in total, they, uh, this raft navigated ob almost 500 kilometers uh, with no problem to reach almost to the, uh, the coastal area of the Australia now. And during this December is winter times. Winter times, the wind direction is from the north to the south. So uh, in these regions. So if they depart in the winter times, they even the, the raft, a bamboo raft is just drifting. Uh, they highly a pass possibility to reach to the, the continent, somewhere, somewhere in the continental coast in this case. So uh, this is the final page for the discussion. So the Wallachian case, so sea crossing from the island to the continent possibly the bamboo raft with the pr primitive sail might be able to reach to Safur coast by north wind during the winter seasons. But uh, in the case of uh, Ryukyu, like continent or island, we don't, we don't know where they're from, but to the island navigation, um, I still believe the bamboo raft with sail can be potential candidate. Even the team Kaifu, uh, Dr. Kaifu never tried to, to, to use the bamboo raft but I still believe can be possible. But uh, their uh, project also confirmed uh, Dagar Kanu can be another candidate in the case of the Ryukyu Islands. But the most important uh, uh, reason the, or exact reason, if so, why the, the pristine human 
the Homo sapiens, I mean, uh, tried to cross the sea to reach the, such a small islands by such a high risky uh, navigation or migration into Ryukyu is still not sure yet. Yeah, maybe there are some reasons uh, in, the, in the starting part of places, but uh, we're still not sure. Yeah, so the, our study and archaeological studies, they have more um, topics to have to uh, research in the future, but this is for our next target in our uh, uh, investigation. Okay, uh, now it's almost 45 or over 45 minutes and thank you very much for listening. Yeah, that's all, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rintaro. This was a wonderful and very informative presentation. I was not expecting that you uh, put so many aspects of uh, maritime archaeology and, and your researches in, in this one lecture. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I'm, well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to learn about uh, the new dates from, from the earliest uh, deeper layers in, in Topogaro too. So that's, that's quite exciting news. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. And I, I also appreciate very much uh, the last part of uh, your talk with uh, experimental archaeology, with uh, the different possibilities on crossing the open seas and, and all those attempts. And yes, I, I think I would also prefer to, to try out a watercraft uh, with a sail rather than uh, rowing. But yeah. Dr. Kaifu was successful, so kudos to, to that. Uh, but I, I, I'm sure that there's uh, quite a, there will be quite a lot of, of more experiments uh, coming up uh, in the very near future, because this is now such a, an important and, and uh, very exciting research where, where more and more people, uh, colleagues in, in from the entire region are involved. Okay, so um, thanks again. And I now like to introduce our respondent, uh, Dr. Rixa Fuentes. And, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Ono already mentioned uh, his uh, work several times. So Rick Saar is a faculty member of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And, he specializes in Southeast Asian archaeology, in prehistoric technology and anthropology. Uh, and as you have already heard, the microscopic useful analysis of stone tools and the determination of their past functions, uses, and most importantly, the related human activities. And in fact, he's one of the most prominent experts in microware analysis in the region. His research focuses on the prehistory of island Southeast Asia and especially early technologies associated with seafaring, maritime interaction and the peopling of remote islands. He has been the recipient of prestigious research grants from the Gerda Henkel Foundation in Düsseldorf, the German Academic Exchange Service, the AAD, and the Erasmus Mundus program of the European Union. And he completed his PhD in archaeological sciences at the University of Tübingen in Germany. He is a member of the Archaeology of Mindoro project, the Traces Deep Time Archaeological Collaboratory, and of course the Cultural History of Paleo Asia project, where, as you uh, could just see, he collaborates with Professor Ono. Thank you very much for being with us, Rick Saar, and uh, it's your turn. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, I would just like to add some more to what Dr. Ono already presented. That was a very good presentation. And Island Southeast Asia, especially Wallace, is actually a very ideal uh, area if you want to study island adaptation and behavioral modernity, because this is the first time that humans actually crossed bodies of water. So it never happened before. And if you've noticed, uh, the focus is on how people actually crossed from one island to another. Although this is a very simple question, it's actually very difficult for us to answer. Because as Dr. Ono mentioned, we actually don't have any direct evidence of what they used to travel. So we're trying to do some experiments. And we're trying to also find evidences from other forms of artifacts. So we have evidence of 
use of fish hooks, for example, that entails that the people be people before were actually uh, conducting open sea fishing. So that involves um, technologies that were never invented before. So actually, Island Southeast Asia is a very important site or area, especially Wallacea, if you want to talk about behavioral modernity. And I would just like to add, this is also the, the area where we can find the oldest evidences of rock painting. So that's in the same island where Topogaro Cave, uh, where Topogaro Cave is. So that's uh, located in southern part of Sulawesi, while Topogaro is in the central part of Sulawesi. And based on the three examples, we actually noticed that although they are almost um, in the same period, they were actually um, occupied or the people in those areas or in those cave sites actually adapted differently to different kinds of environments. So in the Yang Saru, we noticed that the people were actually processing plants starting from 35,000 years ago, while in Jeremalai, they were conducting open sea fishing, while in Topogaro, they were hunting large or medium-sized mammals. So during this time, um, we know that the environment in islands South Asia actually had a lot of effects to evolution, to adaptation, and to the development of technologies. And I would just like to add our results from useware analysis. So for those of you who, who are wondering what useware analysis is, so it's basically just trying to identify how stone tools were used before. So we know that the people were actually producing stone tools, and our specialization allows us to identify how the stone tools were used in the past. And it's very useful for, for Island Southeast Asia because we actually don't have formal tool types compared to Africa or compared to Europe. So if you talk about uh, formal tool types, we actually don't have like a sequence of how stone tools progressed in our prehistoric record. So if you recover a stone tool from 40,000 years ago, like in one of the sites that, that was mentioned, it's also possible that the same stone tool was still being used during the historical period and the shape or form never changed. So that's really a problem in island Southeast Asia. And again, I would just like to connect this with a different uh, problem that we have here. This is about the Habambu hypothesis. It's basically uh, telling us that the people before do not need to change their stone tool technology because they already have other forms of technology such as bamboo. So they were using bamboo, especially in cutting something like a knife in replacement or probably a complement to stone tools. And this is actually very important because most of the time for useware analysis, we are trying to identify how or which plants were processed in the past. And because of uh, Dr. Intar's presentation, we could actually explore the idea that probably the people before were processing plants in order to create boats or sea crafts because most of the um, components of those sea craft that were mentioned in the experiments were actually all made of plants. So we already have evidence in the archaeological record that they were actually processing plants, and we only need to connect that or try to identify uh, specific um, products that they were able to create after processing plants, and that includes resin, for example, fiber, or of course, uh, bamboo itself. Okay, and uh, I just have a question to Dr. Ono. So we're talking about uh, long distance crossing, and I think you also mentioned this, um, about the uh, number of people who probably migrated, because in your experiments, it's always like uh, in the raft, in the raft experiments in Japan, for example, they only have around five people. Um, how many people do you think were uh, trying to cross from one island to another before, or what is the capacity of this Seacraft technology? Yeah, thank you very much, Rick, for the questions. Yeah, um, I can actually I cannot answer in, in details, but uh, because I'm not a specialist about uh, yeah this kind of topic, uh, this is just uh, introducing the uh, the Dr. Kai Fu's project for today. But uh, according to their project and study, uh, they also calculate uh, the, the the first group, the number of the people for the first group to migrations. Um, According to them, they they think at least um, 10, 10 to 20 people hmm, could be enough. So in, in that case, of course, the one dug out canoe is just five person, person uh, 
person can can write on it's not enough so should be if it's really int intentional um migration they have to um depart with several boats or canoes if they use the canoe or dugout canoes because the capacity is five or six people for one boat so it should be more more numbers of the canoes needed for the the migrations so it's i i don't think so it's it's um have potential high potential for such cases in the pricing times so as my last slide says we're still not sure why the reasons exact reason why they have to cross the sea to migrate to the, such a small island if they from the continent because continent usually have more resources even including the marine or land terrestrial whatever but on the other case like in Wallacea, uh, they cross from the one of the small islands like timor or maybe in the maluku islands uh, with the very limited resources especially the terrestrial resources place and uh, once they reach to the continent they have more potential for the resource use and etc so in this case uh, they have some exact reasons to cross the sea, but we're still not sure about the uh, Ryukyu one case. But in also the the uh, uh, case, um, if they need ten or twenty people to cross for to uh, to survive in in the new places, uh, if they use the bamboo raft, you can see the bamboo rafts can be quite bigger. And even the 10 or 20 people can can also ride on in the same time. And they're just rafting, uh, drifting. But if they depart from the uh, in the winter times, they you know, possibly they, they could reach to the somewhere in, in the continent. So so the, the two cases are quite different. And maybe the situation also quite different. So we have to separate these two cases and discuss more further. But this is my answer so far. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, it's fine. Thanks for answering my question. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was actually asking you that because uh, I was thinking of the like uh, the founding populations or the initial population mm. uh, required for them to be able to survive once they cross. So it's just the first step of of populate uh, of colonizing the other islands. Once you reach that, you actually need to maintain a certain number for your population to survive. And I think some other researchers also. Uh, try to compute this, like probably they give figures such as 1,300 or even a thou thousands of people uh, mm. needed to be on the other island after crossing for them to be able to survive or to be successful in colonizing. And uh, yeah, probably we'll find more evidence of that in the future because I think there are no fossils yet in those sites that you mentioned in Wallacea, direct uh, human fossils. Yeah. But one of the cases in the like, Rukyu, in Ishigaki, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we're not sure how many the, the first migrants, how many number of the first migrants, but the, the archaeological evidence uh, clearly indicate because 90 individual of the, the late present times, um, only one site, one cave site pro provided 90 individual. It, it, it's including boys, I, I mean, the, the kids, children, and also the adult, female and males. It's all mixture, and that's uh, exactly the the um, um, uh, traces of at least in Ishigaki. There are many human people, uh, human survived in that small island, and during the late Pleistocene, I don't know uh, how 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 many of them in the first time, or maybe several times of the people uh, reach to the islands and then meet each other, or I don't know what happened, but <laughs> eventually anyway. Uh, they, what the the, uh, uh, the fact is, they uh, continue to survive in the island environment in Ishigaki, and that's why there are many uh, human remains of individual uh, excavated just one site from uh, Shinoko Sanet Baru, and that's very interesting points. We don't know, uh, yeah, how to explain in this case, but uh, it's very interesting. I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. thanks for answering that question. So actually, I don't have a lot of comments. So uh, I'm just really curious of the sea craft or boat uh, technology. And probably 
uh, will be able to conduct experiments associated with that because I think the experiments that they conducted um, used very thick uh, bamboo. It's actually very difficult to process that using small shirt flakes because what we have, uh, for example, in Topogara and Liang Saru are tiny or small flakes, uh, less than 5 cm or around 5 centimeters. And it's actually very difficult. I tried doing experiments using uh, bamboo with the thinner, uh, yeah, thinner bamboo. It's really possible. But I think for the larger ones, like the experiments that they did in southern China, they actually used larger flakes. So you need to have like core tools in order for you to extract bamboo. And I don't know if we actually have those large flakes in uh, sites that are associated with uh, mother sapiens, at least for Topogara and Liang Saru, uh, dated around 40 to 30,000 years ago. Um, probably in the future, is, this is just an insight, probably in the future we'll try to conduct experiment using a combination of uh, technologies. So uh, we actually haven't used half the technologies yet because in islands of this Asia, half thing, so half thing is actually attaching a stone tool to a handle in order for you to create, like it's a very complex tool. And you can you can create spear points, arrow points, and at the same time you can also create uh, those uh, hand at hand access that will make it very easy for you to extract wood, for example, or even bamboo. So probably we'll have that uh, in the next few experiments. But I think my perspective uh, about plant processing now is that um, although we have evidence, it was actually only very intensive, at least for the presence of plant polishes around 20,000 years ago or during the last glacial maximum. We have evidence from, let's say, 35,000 years ago, but uh, what we have, especially in Topogara, for example, is that uh, we find traces that the people were processing bones, animal bones, because of the impact scars. But if you talk about uh, intensive plant working from 40,000 years ago, it's still difficult really to say. Probably uh, we need to get more samples. Because for user analysis, there are actually just very few samples out of uh, uh, several thousands of tools. So yeah, I think that's a possible project in the future. You can also try that. And uh, just a closing comment. I think there are some questions. Um, I would just like to highlight, uh, again, islands Southeast Asia, especially Wallacea, and also Japan, the Ryukyu Islands. This is very unique. Uh, this is actually... This actually never happened before that the modern humans um, crossed bodies of water. So we have evidence of fossils in Australia. That's why we're looking for evidences along the way. So we know that they were there, but we actually don't know where exactly they, they, crossed, they crossed and where exactly and what technologies they brought with them. That's why this project and all the other projects in Indonesia are very uh, important in our understanding of uh, of uh, adaptation to island environments. I think that's all, um, Dr. Pavlik. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuentes. Uh, that was uh, a lot of insight. And thank you also for uh, giving some background and detail on uh, what we were doing with uh, the stone tools uh, of those sites, uh, uh, user analysis and experimentation in order to uh, be able to identify and, and recognize and make some sense of the microscopic traces of, of wear and tear that uh, we find on those uh, ancient stone tools. I, I'm, I'm also I'm, uh, quite amazed about those large distances that they had to cross without the possibility of, of island hopping, so really crossing more than 100 kilometer um, or in the case of the Ryukyu Islands, even as much as 270 kilometer. And, and they managed to, to do this. Uh, another aspect um, that, that still puzzles me, and I, I don't think I have a, a good solution for that, is that we, we see it, as uh, Rix already mentioned, we see different kinds of uh, subsistence strategies in, in the different sites uh, that you presented, Rintaro. So we have uh, sites like on Leang Saru and Talaut Islands, where obviously uh, there are no uh, remains of, of larger mammals because the, the island uh, probably didn't have any. Uh, you would expect that there was a lot of, of fishing going on, but then it's mainly shell fishing. Um, while on the coastal side in Topugaro, um, 
we would expect also fishing, but no, it's it's more of a terrestrial uh, based uh, subsistence strategy. And I, I'm also thinking about our own sites and, and excavations in Mindoro Island uh, here in the Philippines, where we excavate uh, as well several sites, but uh, three main sites that have produced a combined uh, chronology that is similarly old. We have our oldest radiocarbon dates of around 32 or even 35,000 years from Bubok 1 in Ilin Island, a small island, uh, but very near just off the coast of uh, Mindoro Occidental land. This island was actually uh, connected to the mainland of Mindoro uh, during the Pleistocene or most of the time at the Pleistocene. Um, so it's very similar and, and very near to Mindoro, but we have there uh, a mix of everything. We, we have uh, a very large shell midden, so we, we have evidence of uh, really shell fishing in, in large amounts. We have also uh, numerous uh, fish remains, and of course you, you know that very well since you have been the advisor of uh, the researcher who did uh, the study of, of the fish bones of, of our sites and other sites and for her PhD. Uh, Clara Boulanger, and we, we we have we have also a variety of terrestrial animals. So they hunted, they they, they went shell fishing, they went fishing, uh, they hunted uh, wild pig. We have uh, bones of deer, uh, we have even uh, tamarau, uh, uh, water buffalo, similar to the anoa. But what we don't really have are stone tools, while your sites pro sites produced huge amounts of stone tools and, and quite a variety of stone tools and lots of fair traces of stone tools. We have very little about that and we have very few stone tools, especially in the layers where um, they focused on, on shell fishing, where we have large shell deposits we find as the only stone tool, practically uh, unmodified pebbles from the beach that they used as hammers to, to open those larger and, and more massive shells. We don't find these amounts of, of flakes. We don't find uh, really uh, tools like uh, in, in Topogaro and uh, in Leang Saro. And, and this is something I, I still try to, to understand. We have a few uh, stone tools from the, from the oldest layers uh, dated to between 28,000 and 35,000, but in really very small amounts. And I don't really know what, uh, what they did differently. We, we know that they used some of the shells to make tools, but again, in certain amounts, and they might have uh, substituted for stone tools, but not really in, in large amounts. So we might also look at a kind of a specialized uh, function of the sites. And maybe they did certain activities in the cave on, on, on Ilin Island in Bubok and other activities that maybe involved more stone tools uh, somewhere else outside. And we, we haven't found any open sites uh, so far from that period, I think in the entire Philippines, we, we don't have open sites and um, we, we may never find them because those uh, sites, those coastal sites that existed and, and that were settlements during the Pleistocene are now underwater and very difficult to access. So we are also looking at quite a gap and, and certain uh, unknowns and, and mysterious situations. So still, I, I, I don't know exactly what to make out of it. It's, it's just uh, uh, quite obvious that uh, those sites that all belong to, to a same but, but rather large region uh, have their own char characteristics and their own functions, purposes, and have been settled by uh, early humans, modern humans that have been very uh, doing very well in, and, and have been specialized in, in dealing with very different subsistence strategies. Yeah, thank you very much, Alfred. Yeah, actually the case in Mindoro actually really similar to the case in Ryukyu, Okinawa. 
because most of the lay plastic sites in Okinawa also produce none or very few of uh, lithic stone tools. So we don't know why. Maybe the scars of the source of the lithic for to use uh, may make a good uh, stone tools. Um, I don't know the case in Mindoro. Maybe it's a similar that just you know because of the the scars of uh, uh, source lithic source or maybe they have plenty of uh, source but they did use or just the site function difference of the site function. But uh, in the case of Ryukyu, we don't have in any any of the site doesn't have so much of the lithic either. So this might be the next target to, for the compa future comparative analysis or study. Yeah, in the Philippines and uh, also the UQ. Actually, they, they are close each other. Yeah. yeah, Philippines and Taiwan then is to uh, already reach to uh, Yonaguni or Ishikaki, quite close. Yeah, just you, you have to cross the Batanes. Batanes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, very true. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, if any questions or from the students or something, yeah, I'm very welcome. I think we have uh, questions. Uh, okay. Aito, can you yes, take um, over, please? <laughs> yes. Uh, very quickly, we have a question from Trish Palsonit. She says, of course, thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. On. Um, I wanted to ask about the comparative intensity in exploitation between marine or coastal resources and terrestrial hunting, and what the observed trends are, preference, uh, seasonality, regarding these uh, strategies. OK. Um, thank you very much for the questions. And um, you, um, I mean, I catch the meaning, so the company in this expression, the case of uh, maybe he he or she, yeah, asking about the case of the, the case in Bolasia, Bolasian Islands. And um, um, yeah, we not still not sure actually, we not still not sure the, the exact reasons. Yeah, can be preference, but and also can be seasonality. But once I, uh, uh, based on my understanding, actually the very different environment backgrounds in each site. So some like in uh, Timor um, and other islands in nearby the Timor Islands during the late Pleistocene to the even the Holocene times, and many of the sites produce large number of fish, not, not all the site, but uh, many of the sites produce the, the fish remains and also the fish food. But it, on the contrary, in the, sites around the northern northern routes, uh, including the, the sites I introduced today, like uh, Leansalu and uh, Topogaro, and also the, all the other sites uh, we excavated or already excavated in, in the, around the northern, northern routes, uh, they never uh, provide any kinds of fish hook, in, in, at least in Indonesia, yeah. Uh, the mineral case is no ex exceptional, but the, but even in, including the Philippines, we don't have the J J J shape, yeah, fish hook uh, from the Pleistocene sites uh, in in these area regions. Um, maybe this is because maybe because it's preference, but maybe also different techniques or technology built to the technology. So more like a technological reasons can be, and also but the most important things is why they don't need or they didn't use such hooks and they don't need uh, fish remains or uh, fish resources for survival. Maybe because they have another, other, more other uh, resources uh, instead of the fish remains or maybe more hard to access to the, these uh, fish resources in the Northern part. Uh, we're still not sure. We have some of the hypothesis and uh, yeah, it is also a good, um, idea to, to check about their preferences and seasonality as well for, for the uh, possible reasons. But it's going to be, uh, have to be investigated in uh, future studies. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ono, Dr. Fuentes, and Dr. Pankley. Thank you very much. Um, we are almost at the end of uh, our webinar. Maybe, uh, out of curiosity, uh, Rintaro, one, one last question. 
Uh, you, you just came back from, from the field. You just excavated uh, in the Ryukyu Islands. How, how is it to excavate uh, during the ongoing pandemic? What's different or was there anything different? Uh, you mean, um, yeah, about the pandemic, creation with pandemic situation and excavation. Yes, because we have very limited time and also uh, um, the timing is quite important because now mm -hmm. like, like in, here in Osaka and most of the place like also in Okinawa, we are all locked down situation. So very hard for us to walk around or move and visit Okinawa now. But uh, the last month, uh, last uh, March, just one month is because the, the last uh, lockdown was just uh, finished in the early of March. And soon after, just one week after the, the end of the lockdown, uh, we moved to the Okinawa for excavation. And then three weeks excavation in Okinawa in Ishigaki, and we back end of the March. And then already the area of the airport, uh, the number of the, the patient increased again, dramatically in Japan and especially in Osaka. And uh, until the middle, middle of the airport, already the, another uh, lockdown started in Osaka until now. So now we, we can't move anymore. So it's really important is the timing but once we, we have the, the timing or chance, uh, at least two or four weeks, then we can do that. Um, but nothing happened, just it's normal during this time. Yeah, and just no, not so many people in Okinawa, but only mostly the local peoples, but uh, yeah, quite nice. And, uh, but the problem is just timing and we don't know the timing. It's very hard to uh, adjust the schedule. Yeah, but except it is it's just same like uh, as usual. Uh, yeah, like a previous uh, excavation as well. And now like in like Indonesia, we, we are hard to access to Indonesia now from us, maybe from the Philippines and from Japan either. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indonesian people, uh, archaeologists already start work and excavation in, in their own country. And I, I know the like uh, the Somboli project, maybe Rick knows about Somboli. Yeah, project it's in a, a cave site, a lot of cave site around the coast with a lot of nice rock art paintings. And now the team excavating uh, the one one of the big cave, uh, and uh, since the, the two years ago, and they just started the uh, uh, excavation in this this season this year, uh, from today or yesterday I had. So for them this is more like normal. So to do, do this kind of excavation. So I envy them, but uh, for us, we still cannot access or to the other countries. So uh, yeah, but inside the, in the domestic excavation in, inside the Japan, I still can do do same like in Indonesian cases. Uh, but I'm sorry for, for you too, to in the Philippine cases, but as you still cannot go, go, go around. Yeah, our <laughs> hands are tight. Very hard, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do hope you can go, go to the Mindoro quite soon. Yeah. I, I hope so. Um, I'm not sure if, if it will work uh, this year or if you have to wait until next year. But you really, you had the, the perfect timing uh, in March. So that's, mm. uh, that's quite nice. Yeah, I, I guess everyone uh, misses going to the field and, and is very eager to, to continue, especially if it's an ongoing project and, and we don't know what, what's happening at, at the sites uh, yeah. while we are here and, and uh, if everything is still the same and uh, if we can just continue where we, we ended uh, more than two years ago, perhaps. Okay, so we, we are a little bit uh, past our time it's 3 34 in manila so thank you very much dr ono thank you dr fuentes many thanks for joining this webinar and today's session um, actually concludes our webinar series for for this semester or here at ateneo a rather short quarter but we will continue of course we will continue with our webinars in archaeology and we are currently preparing the term card for the next semester and we'll announce it during the coming intercession. 
So please stay tuned and visit uh, the Facebook page of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology regularly for updates. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day and stay safe and see you soon again. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, Alfred.